This is exactly what we want to showcase. A lot of times people have this you know, preconception of what a founder is like, and they just assume everything's easy and a straight shot. And what you're, what you're sharing is it takes a lot of grit, some creative problem solving, persistence every single day. And a lot of times things won't go your way, yeah. but you have to adapt, yeah, figure it out, totally. get back up and move forward. And so now you have a, a really great, it seems like a small uh, small team, you you got some really great feedback. You're building the product, which is obviously very, very exciting. And congratulations on your most recent round. So Thank even you. after kind of going through that a little bit and like, what, what what's your kind of philosophy of hiring and, and in recruiting now? Like, why do you think your company RevOp is, is something that people should kind of really seriously look into if they're looking for a new job opportunity, especially in an industry where there's so many other early stage companies out there, right? So like, yeah. what's, what's an X factor of you guys or something that you feel like makes you special <laughs> or stand out? I think there's, I think that there's three things that that I like to sort of really hone in on. So one is the problem that uh, we're solving. And, and I'll come back and give more details on this. So one's the problem that we're solving. Two is a team. And three is the impact that each person gets to have. So most people have this uh, concern with like, what if the company goes belly up? Or, uh, you know, am I going to be left high and dry? And like, I think almost regardless of role, like I, I don't think that that for a lot of roles is like necessarily the case. Like I have not met one engineer who's like said, you know, I just can't find a job. Like I, I, I think about like the, the sort of risk reward of being early and being on a small team, if you're ready for it is the third thing, which that I mentioned, which is impact. So you can have a massive impact on a really small team. Like you turn out features that can impact a lot of people. Like you get to deploy things really quickly. You can like help. And that doesn't matter if you're an engineer or like working in support or marketing, like how you impact an organization and what you get to do. Like you get to see the fruits of your labor very, very quickly. I love doing that. Like, I think that's a lot of fun. And that happens when you're seven people, when you're 70 people or 700 people, right? It just it happens at different scales. So so impact is one thing that I mentioned. So I guess I'll work backwards. So impact is one thing. The, the team is the second thing that I think is really important. So, I mean, I gave you my background. I think that having the right team in place that understands what things are urgent, what's not, like how to prioritize, how to work on product, how to, you know, go through a sales motion, just mature leaders rather than some of the horror stories that you can hear in the industry, unfortunately, like, I think that that's a big advantage for us. Worked in, in um, like the ad agency world for 10 years on the engineering side. And then was one of the early engineers at Birchbox, which a lot of people have heard of um, as a, you know, direct to consumer company uh, that had a lot of tech on the back end. Um, and then he stood up a lot of engineering teams, you know, from zero. So you, you add that with like, We've got some really seasoned engineers. We have one person who helps lead our, you know, support marketing efforts. We have somebody who I used to work with at my prior company on the sales side. And so it's a culture of collaboration, of getting better, of giving people candid feedback so that we can all improve, myself included, and and just make something that really means something to a lot of people. So that leads me to like the last thing, which is that, you know, what we're doing is helping people get the, to start, we're helping people get the best price to sell their car. That means that they are coming to us because they believe that this is going to be the place where they could make or save the most amount of money. And the, the reason why this is important is that what people don't realize is that the average discrepancy between highest and lowest offer on cars is over 30%. So if you're actually going and going to go sell your car, if you don't get as many offers as possible on the car, perhaps obviously, then you could potentially leave a lot of money on the table. And for the average American, if you have, you know, another thousand dollars or $2,000 on the price of your car, like that's a meaningful amount of money. So in terms of like impact, I think that that's just a really, really huge benefit to joining our company in particular, because it means that like you get to actually impact almost every person in this country because um, the average household owns two cars. So like 
this is the most important asset that people own. And, you know, more important than real estate because more people actually own cars than real estate. Um, there's 250 million cars on the road. There's a ton of drivers, <laughs> like everybody owns cars, you know, maybe not in New York city, but you know, in the majority of the country, people own cars. So it's, it's a combination of three things, right? It's like being, it's having a, a company mission that you're super excited about, uh, working with a seasoned team that has really strong investors who have super deep pockets and have come time and time again to actually reinvest in the company. Uh, and then three is like having a really big impact day to day. You get to like actually see the fruits of your labor. Look, early stage, like a lot of things just kind of don't work out. There's a lot of different reasons for it. Everybody's trying to find their place and sometimes things just like don't work and there's no hard feelings about it. And that's kind of how I feel about it. And like, we have a really solid team now. So the general thinking is like, you always need a technical leader when you're building a technical product. It's very, very challenging to just like contract that. We have Mike. Uh, Mike has, you know, been around the block for a while. Um, and you know, it's, it's been fantastic. So we have, now we have like a, a larger engineering team. We've got three other engineers in, in addition to Mike and like, it's just super important, right? You need quality control on what you're building, when you're releasing it, you know, syncing up on cycles and all those things are just super, super important. So you start and we started like early days by hacking a lot of things together. Mm -hmm. We continuously tried to test things with as like little technology as possible before like leaning in and building something that was going to be a lot more intense. Mm -hmm. And then at a certain point you developed something that got some traction, got a little, maybe you, yeah, right. Um, and then you're like, wow, this is a real thing. And then did you kind of put your heads together, create like an official team or partnership? And then you went off to the VC world to kind of raise some funds to help grow. Yeah. So the story, so at the end of 2020, we had this initial hypothesis right that we were going to make a like service better for dealers and it was going to make it better for customers um and at the time with the market the market was super hot right mm. and we so crossing capital did the series a for building connected which was the last company that i was at mm. i'd gotten to know them over the years especially because um i had like i'd led product teams or sorry sales teams for different products at building connected and then after we got acquired, I'd been speaking with them and they were like, hey, what are you thinking about doing next? And I told them and they were like, oh, we've invested in a couple of auto tech companies. And, you know, why don't you come basically be like an entrepreneur in residence for us? Leave leave Autodesk, be an uh, entrepreneur in residence for us, work on your idea, pitch it to the partnership, and then, you know, we'll fund the company if we if we really like it. And so that's what happened. Um, they were like, listen, this, we know this is just an idea. You've got some really good early data points. And here's, you know, they led a $1.85 million round, like a pre-seed round. And that was awesome. Like that was, they're great capital partners. And and then fast forward, we had kind of like weaved through and found some different things that worked and didn't work. Here's what we learned. Here's like what um, we, you know, think is like the future and what's next. And so that became really crystallized for us you know, 10 or 12 months after they had done the initial funding. And so we were thinking about, okay, what's next for us? Like we need to go and now raise more money. And they, you know, led another round of funding for us, which was $3 million, which we closed in April of this year. So we raised 4.85 total. It's kind of like, we think about this as like one kind of like larger seed round that they've led. And they're just an amazing, amazing partner for us. They got really excited because at, you know, the end of, last year, we had some very strong early data points. So we were finding that, you know, we had this thing where we were like, okay, we built this product for service. People are coming to us to help get, you know, their car serviced. They're giving us feedback. They really want to find a better way to like value their car, figure if they should figure out if they should sell the car, et cetera. What do, what do they do? Right. And so like, we basically piecemealed together a lot of sort of hacky piece of technology. We used some stuff with Typeform, used a bunch of contractors on Upwork and effectively said, let's see if we can get people the best price to sell their car. We'll do this all via email. And 
the response rate from people as we like advertise this a little bit on Facebook was incredibly high. So there was a super, super high need. Like the point to me that like flew off the, where things kind of flew off the shelves was that we put this really high hurdle in front of people. We made them fill out a 51 question form about the condition of their car and 45% of people filled it out. So um, the like conviction that we had was really strong because people were so compelled to like go through this journey because the, of the value proposition that we have. Sure. For a lot of the listeners in our audience, so you, after college, you went to real estate finance. And I think that's something that a lot of people do, right? They go into finance, they go into investment banking, some they go into consulting. And so for your experience, like how, how was that transition to get out of that world into like this, into the tech world? Um, did you just cold apply to companies? Were you headhunted? Um, was it through your network? And um, what sort of maybe uh, transition or ramp up period were, were there, if, if there was any? I had met somebody who had started companies before mm. and he and I worked on a bunch of different ideas. You know, I said, we learned a lot of things not to do. So we built a product without doing like, this was in 2011, 2012, right? So like we built a product without doing any user testing, uh, which was stupid. We were like, this just, we're, you know, Steve Jobs. And this is just like what needs to exist. Now, granted, the idea, I think, like, I'll tell you what it was, and and you'll probably laugh, which is that we were building, we were building a social network, this is in 2012, we built a social network for people to share photos and videos, and then they could buy things that were in those, those photos, videos. Mm. Good business, generally. I mean, that's what Instagram is today. It makes sense. And sadly, that's not what, <laughs> sadly, that's not what happened mm -hmm. for us. But we, I mean, our niche where we started was really within action sports. Mm -hmm. I grew up doing that. And those people are like kind of gearheads. So it just didn't take off. And, and like from there, you know, and like kind of breaking into tech, like I kind of just had this crash course on things to do, things not to do, blah, blah, blah. And because of that, it, I was in this fortunate position where for better or for worse, like I had a good story of, mm -hmm. you know, I'd started a company, it didn't go as planned. We did some friends and family fundraising. Oh, nice. And so getting into tech, like kind of made sense, but I didn't have a lot of experience. So, I mean, you know, at the time, like I did do a lot of cold outreach. There was a lot less noise then than there is now. Like it was harder to find people's email addresses, which I was really good at. And I emailed a bunch of founders and um, I ended up finding the place that I worked at because of a headhunter actually. And I mean, look, a good lesson is like not to not like judge a book by its cover, but just not to make any assumptions. Like I was really not that interested in like, oh, construction tech company, like, eh. I'm not really that keen on it. And I really loved it. Like it was super interesting. There's a ton of companies now that are doing construction tech, which, and there was just not as much verticalized software in, you know, 2014 as there is now. So, you know, I think that there's a lot of different ways to get in. I, I think about, and my advice to people on like, when they're looking to sort of career change is that your options as an individual was like, you're either ready to sort of like learn, like you're basically, you're trying to pick a company where you can like just learn and like, you're in a role where it's going to teach you a lot. Like you're going to, you might not like it, but it's like going to teach you a lot too, is that you're just, you want to be at a company where like the company is just going places, which is kind of a number one. And like the third thing that's like the best of both worlds is that you're in this role and position that's like sort of maybe feels like you have a lot to grow into where you can like do a ton with the role and you really like the company. And that's kind of what ended up happening for me, like just by sort of dumb luck. You know, when I joined, like I said, there were five people. And so I was the sixth person and, and then like we kept growing and growing and then we hired more people and they just kept giving me more and more responsibility. And like, it ended up being like really great. I think that's everyone's dream to, uh, to do when they find a new job, right. To kind of grow with, the rise of a, of a company. And was this the company that ended up getting acquired at the end of the day? Yeah. 
Wow. And so yeah. how, how, how was that experience? I mean, that's also something in the technology industry that people aspire to be part of as well. It's very glamorized, high profile acquisitions. You read in the news all day, you see shows about it on TV and, mm-hmm. and, and moving different platforms. So for you to actually go through it, like what was it like? There are a lot of different types of acquisitions, right? I think that where we, like we raised $57 million, we were acquired for 275. So in terms of like an outcome, it was a really good outcome, just like plain and simple, right? This wasn't like WhatsApp where, you know, they had 20 some odd people or 30 some odd people and they had like not really raised any money and then they got acquired by, they raised a hundred million dollars or something like that. And then they got acquired for, you know, 19 billion. Like that's like a totally like outside of the, outside of your regular sort of normalcy, um kind of thing so that's that's different so this was a a little bit more straight down the middle acquisition and like look it was um it was wild i don't know how else to say it right like with certain acquisitions you can't actually like the executive team and oftentimes it might just be the founders can't actually legally say anything until the deal is penned and that was like the case with us so we came in one day to work and like, they literally were just like, congratulations. There was like champagne sitting, like people literally had no idea what was going on. It was like, it was just, it was weird. Um, so that was definitely odd for a lot of people. Like I had some inclination that something was happening per- perhaps. And then we had had like, you know, the news kind of got broken. It was just like a surprise. I think that it's, you know, you go through these phases like emotionally with this, right? And everybody's is very different. So when you think about the growth of the company, like when I started, there were six, five people. And for me, and like those people that were early, like it was more than a job, right? Like it, it just was. Then you get to, they're different, like kind of clicks that I think about, right? So then there's like 10, you're still this core group. Once you get to like 25, then you start to get people who are still hungry and they're excited to make an impact and stuff, but you start to specialize with your roles a little bit more. So you get from 25 to 50, you double the size in the company, people care, but now you're really hiring people who like, this is a job to them, right? They're, they were at other jobs before, and then you go from 50 to hundred. And then really you start to like accelerate even further. And I, I haven't been at a company that has like accelerated really fast past, you know, 250 people necessarily, Uh, We were kind of merged with other companies that were like large orgs. So we went from basically being a 250 person company to kind of a 1200 person company within a 10,000 person company, which was definitely very different. But the, you know, the majority of the people that we had hired had been hired in the last year. So we hired like a hundred people in a year, which is a lot of people, but the, yeah, I mean, like the feeling was just, it's just, it's just kind of interesting, right? You go through this wave of emotion for me, it was like, you know, it was a lot more than a job for me. I was kind of like living and breathing that. And that was like what I had. I, you know, wasn't married. I didn't have kids. Like, I mean, now I do have those things. So it's, it's like totally different. Right. And for a lot of people, it was just a job. Maybe they had joined a year prior and they were like, wow, well, these things kind of happen. Right. So certainly in San Francisco, that's kind of the like allure and certainly was the time being there and working there. 